Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we take deep dives into topics at the heart of the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Brian Mitchell to talk about decentralized publishing. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED33. So, Brian, uh, I have a topic that I want to kind of revisit and delve a little deeper into. Um, Last year, if you recall, we had an episode about distributed social networks uh, because Mastodon was uh, becoming pretty big at the time. And, And it really got me thinking more and more about, like, what what different offerings do like these distributed decentralized systems have versus a more centralized system Um, and we touched on it a little bit in that episode but i think we can dive a little bit deeper because we were really focused on the social networks back then Uh, but i think we can we can apply this to a lot of other a lot of other applications yeah totally uh, i feel like centralization and distribution distribution are a huge you know, it's kind of the two ways that you can host content on the internet and, Mm -hmm. you know, share things. Uh, And I would like to say that this, the whole concept of like decentralization uh, can be applied in many, many other places besides, you know, like internet content. Um, There's, you know, this a huge debate over whether like, you know, a decentralized market economy is better than like a planned economy, which is, you know, like controlled by one government entity kind of thing. Uh, We're not going to go there (laughs) because we're only really concerned with like digital systems that we're using. We don't care about the real world. (laughs) Exactly. Who even lives there anyway? (laughs) Yeah, to kind of give you, the listener, uh, an idea of what we're talking about here. So centralized systems are going to be any system where control rests under one authority. Um, And most of the consumer-facing online platforms that you might think of uh, are centralized. So um, Facebook, Google Drive, YouTube, stuff like that, you know. Um, Most things that are, like owned by a corporate entity um which is pretty much everything that anybody thinks about because of branding hashtag branding uh those are pretty much all going to be centralized whereas a distributed system um there's a few different names out there distributed decentralized parallel systems right um is made up of a bunch of like individual nodes and each node is in control of itself So these can be modeled after some pretty cool systems that are found in nature, like um, the Wikipedia article that I was reading uh, goes on and on about this one particular species of ant who, like, don't, they they don't have a central authority in their ant colony. Each individual ant just, like, determines what their job is going to be based on what they see other ants doing so the example that they give is like if an ant is meeting other ants that are coming back into the colony and there aren't enough ants coming back successfully from like a harvest run or whatever then that ant might switch from whatever task it's currently doing to harvesting um and so that that really illustrates a lot of the important pieces of a decentralized system where like each node each individual entity has the ability to do most of those jobs that anybody might be doing you know um and uh instead of like basically like top down telling each individual node what to do um they all just kind of share a similar system for determining what they should be doing um and so then like that like that system is what would kind of be tweaked to determine the success or failure of such a decentralized system, right? Um, so you can imagine that like these ants, they probably evolved over time, uh, over the generations, you know, tweaking the kind of like the ratio at which they decide whether or not to perform a certain task, right? Because you don't, you don't want the, the extreme end where you have an ant 
start you know jumping into different things all the time and exactly it's just chaos yeah like any time that i meet an ant that didn't come back successfully from a uh a, a, a hunting uh or a harvesting uh task i'm gonna go harvest like that would be a pretty extreme example because then you'd have a lot of ants trying yeah. to trying to harvest um but yeah uh it's also pretty important for each of these nodes to communicate with each other using like a a previously agreed upon set of protocols um so in terms of if we turn back to the computer science side of things right um that would be what like the the developers who create such a system put into place and that's what they kind of distribute to anybody who wants to like implement one of these nodes right um would be that like that communication layer would have to that would be an essential part of it yeah so uh do you want to go into some of these examples of um systems that are distributed definitely yes all right so let's start with email so as you or today you send emails mostly they're through big services like Gmail or maybe even Yahoo or Hotmail, you know, the big named email providers. But you can spin up your own email server and just start sending things. And due to other reasons, mostly around security and anti-spam, it's not necessarily the case today in a useful sense. But you could spin everything up on your own and just start sending messages to other email servers and it should go there. Yep. And and I think that one of the big reasons that email is a decentralized system is because of the environment uh, in which it was created. Um, email has been around since, like, I think the 70s um, yeah. when, like, maybe even pre-internet. This may have been in the days of ARPANET. Oh, definitely. Uh, I think so. Yeah, where they... they created a protocol for different you know researchers people who are at at different universities or different installations to be able to send each other human readable messages and they named it email it was you know is a way for everyone in their own universities who had access to um their servers they could say okay uh we'll start accepting things here and everyone had their own kind of system and so this was the common way of sending messages across yeah uh, different universities Yep, yep. Um, even if we fast forward to like when you and I were growing up, Brian, in the in the early two thousands, um, most of what we were seeing on the internet were decentralized in some way. So, for example, um, blogs, web comics, podcasts those those types of media started to become really big uh, in the in you know the the late nineties, early two thousands, and almost all of those were. Um, were published under these decentralized systems, uh, my favorite being RSS feeds. Um, because in that kind of system, each individual creator, each each publisher owns their own website. And then, um, you know, they, they publish this file uh, called an RSS feed and anybody else can go and periodically check that RSS feed and, you know, um, have a program just keep track of which articles in that rss feed they have read and which ones they have not and stuff like that um and so there's no central authority there it's it's all kind of peer to peer um and then on top of this so the rss and email are the open standards that this is all built upon mm -hmm. but the the common things like gmail or maybe blogger or blogspot or tumblr they were all built they, they support exporting RSS in the end, so you can consume it in a general distributed way, you know, and your RSS reader would then import any RSS feed in the web as long as it was of a RSS file type. Mm -hmm. And so you might have centralized systems that a lot of people use to create this content, but you can kind of consume it in a very distributed way. Yeah. And it's, it's also worth noting that, like, these systems have grown over the years you know um they're like for example podcasts i don't think there's anywhere in the original rss spec that like uh, you, th there was no definition for a standardized way to insert like mp3 files into a 
an RSS feed. Um, but somebody started doing that and, you know, other people started noticing. And so then they kind of together built this this uh, agreed upon way to format stuff in an RSS feed. Um, Apple definitely had a huge hand in, in you know, shaping the way that the community uh, formatted their RSS feeds for that purpose. Um, and, and, you know, nowadays, like most, I mean, all podcast uh, players obviously can, can play that, but like many general purpose RSS readers can also just handle like, oh, here's a media file. I'll like make that available in line as just like a media item. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very open format. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, also things like, uh, phone networks are pretty decentralized. Um, there, there are like, of course, like physical switchboards that you have to connect to, right? And like, I'm thinking of landline systems anyway. Yeah. And often Um, those are owned by these private companies. So I think there are big inter, you know, junction points where mm -hmm. the lines cross or spliced together yeah but you can compare that in terms of like the internet itself which is definitely built to be a a decentralized system there are still like you know the dns servers if you can't get a hold of a dns server you're going to have a really hard time uh getting the ip address for a website that your computer has not visited before um yeah so even though even though like it is mostly decentralized like there are still failure points. It's just that because there are multiple like DNS servers available uh, and there are different routing options, right? Then you can still usually, usually find what you're looking for. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the other one you have here is volunteer computing projects. Mm-hmm. So this is, I've, I've looked at a little bit. So there are some projects out there where they just need raw computing power. So you can download their client and, you know, basically register your computer as, okay, I can compute some stuff, and then their maybe centralized management server will send you some stuff to just crunch on, and you send back the results. And I think this is how, like, render farms, you know, how Pixar would render a movie. You know, it's kind of the same way. You would you would have a bunch of nodes that are all the kind of secondary machines that you can just kind of pop in, pop out. They'll do the work as they see fit. That's kind of orchestrated by this by the centralized server, but they're all working together in a pretty generic distributed way to accomplish a task. Yeah. And that, I think that one gets closest to this concept of like distributed computing. Um, Cause mostly what I've been thinking of distributed systems as is literally just like the publishing aspect of like, you know, public information that's going to be out there. Um, but there of course is a, a whole world of like how, do we build systems where like a bunch of computers that aren't being managed by a central authority, how can they work together to accomplish a particular computing task? Um, And so that's like a very different uh, programming challenge than, than I think I ever saw uh, during our time at U of M Morris. Yeah. Um, And, and peer to peer like file transfer networks, like the BitTorrent protocol, you have trackers where, uh, you have a few centralized servers that manage saying, okay, you, uh, this is what's in the pool. And so you say, these clients are all available. You can talk to each other. And then they kind of ping each other saying, hey, you got, do you have this file? Do you have this, do you have this chunk? And they can kind of talk to each other. But you have a few centralized trackers. And then those, you can have fallbacks. You can have several that are all registered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so they're kind of load balancing the the centralization aspect. So most of these examples that we've given uh, have been fairly old examples, but there are some newer um, concepts in the decentralized world, Um, blockchain being one of them. Very, very big topic. Uh, Everybody's going gaga over blockchain. Oh, yes. And um, and this one actually is a very interesting example because like one of the big challenges when you've got a decentralized system is like if one if if one node goes down and that was like the only place where a particular piece of information was available then there you go it's lost right um and that gets into uh issues of like link rot 
um, is something that I absolutely hate, uh, you know, especially as, yep. as somebody who publishes uh, podcasts that have links in the show notes to other, you know, future or further reading and stuff like that. Um, if those links are no longer valid, then I'm out of luck, right? Um, and I can't possibly go back and like keep checking every single link in every single uh, podcast episode that we've published. To- I think your solution is to open up every link you put in the show notes in web.archive.org. Yeah. So it indexes it the moment you use it, and then it's always there. There you go. Um, but then you're depending on a centralized service exactly. to host archival footage. Exactly. Or archival exactly. Internet. Um, so the blockchain the kind of solves this problem um, because the blockchain is a way for you know all of these different computers that are in a particular network to all have a record of what's been going on on that blockchain um and you probably wouldn't want to do this for like all of the content that's out there on the internet that would be unmanageable because then literally everybody would have to be storing all of the internet um but like if you if you apply it to a smaller system uh then it could uh um, then it could work a little bit better. Yeah, as long as you make sure it's distributed and know like one party has over 50% control because then they can change the truth and then the other clients will be like, well, over half the, the swarm agrees. Let's yep. pick it up as fact. Yep, yep. Um, And then also uh, Federation is... I'm not sure if this is a brand new concept, but this is one that I hadn't really heard about until Mastodon became big. Yeah, I'm not familiar um, so basically, this is just the the concept that like, all right, if we have a, a a like a distributed system where like traditionally when you think of a distributed system, you think okay, like we put like the source code out there and anybody can go and like create their own instance of this thing. So for example, like I could go and um, make a, a website have it be based on WordPress, right? But it's still hosted on my own server. Um, But that doesn't mean that, like, it's going to interoperate with all of the other sites that are running on WordPress, right? Um, And in that that situation, I probably wouldn't want them to. I just want my website to, like, be a a website, you know? Um, But in the case of, like, Mastodon, which is a social network, they wanted each of the different instances to be able to communicate with each other and share um, content throughout the whole the whole system, and um, federation has come into it, like to my attention again now um, because earlier this week, as of as of recording here on uh, June sixth, two thousand eighteen, um, Microsoft announced that they were uh, acquiring GitHub which is a very interesting example of a centralized platform that is built on top of a decentralized um, protocol, Git. Um, And of course, like anybody in the world can, can, you know, like host their own Git server to, you know, just have your own like um, repository of code on there. But nobody else is really going to be able to find that. Um, And... So I was I was reading through a, a, a forum thread on Hacker News that uh, actually Ryan posted to us. Uh, no, he posted it on Twitter, um, talking about how a lot of people are importing their their uh, code repositories into GitLab, which is an open source alternative to GitHub. Um, and one of the top comments was talking about like, hey. Did you know that GitLab is looking into the possibility of like federation so that other people who are hosting their own GitLab servers, like everybody can will still be able to see each other's code repositories no matter where it's hosted. So that would be like a true decentralized um, system. Hmm. Yeah, that's an uh, interesting thought. Because without that federation, like GitLab.com is still a centralized repository built on top of Git. And even though it is open source, that is, you know, that particular instance would still not be a decentralized system. Yeah. Yeah. On the topic of that Hacker News post, another comment said that, yes, GitLab is open source 
the Scylla for profit company and their servers run on Azure, which are run by Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. And then somebody else, of course, was talking, was uh, replied with like, oh, yeah, they're they're looking into uh, switching over to Google Cloud, whatever, whatever, um, probably because Google is a big venture capital uh, investor in GitLab. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Once you really look in, it's all pretty much connected. Mm hmm. This whole concept of decentralization also ties into uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and we talked a little bit about this a couple of months ago on our episode about the singularity. Um, but uh, in AI research, they the traditional way of going about it was to build up like these knowledge based systems. So if you think about the, uh, you know, Deep Blue that was built to uh beat the the grandmaster at chess um they they you know basically had it like brute force every single move that it that it knew about uh in the game and figure out like what um you know what was going to be the best move and they based those on uh like they asked experts they consulted with expert uh chess players to see like okay what are you know the best moves here um and they and and AI research has uh, shifted largely from that kind of approach, from from creating a large knowledge base to just treating intelligence as an emergent property of simpler interactions, um, which I think also ties into just like the concept of society, uh, where you know all of us as individuals we make our own decisions, but then as a collective, like those decisions build up, and we all kind of like are doing something more than any of us as individuals realize. If you take a big enough step back, you know, humanity is really one entity, right? You yeah, know? yeah. Um, and just like just like you yourself are made up of a distributed network of cells mm -hmm. that all are working together and individually have no idea what's going on, but somehow they work in yeah, a controlled way. I definitely, I definitely blew my own mind when I started thinking about like neuron networks and like people as just like having the role of an individual neuron yeah yeah it's it's wild the extra dimension is supported only by listeners like you who voluntarily donate on our patreon money we make through patreon will go towards buying research materials and improving the quality of the show our content has always been released for free and always will be, but if you go that extra mile, you can get cool rewards like day one access to The Fringe, our behind the scenes show, access to polls to help us choose future subjects for the extra dimension, access to show docs as we're working on them, Nexus stickers, your name shouted out right here on the show, and much more. Not to mention, you'll have my eternal gratitude. So if you're interested in helping us take this to the next level, join us at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. So let's, uh, I mean, we touched on this a little bit, but let's talk about some of the pros and cons of decentralized and centralized systems. Um, so decentralized systems tend to be more resilient as a whole, right? So it's harder to take down the entire system. Um, the users are usually more in control because um, they can choose between many different options that are going to offer them kind of comparable um, services. So in the case of like emails, right? I could choose from what from many, many, many different um cloud-based email uh, providers. Uh, it's much harder to block a decentralized system, right? Um, so like, I think of this uh, as a teacher at, at Harding High School, right? St. Paul Public Schools loves to block stuff that they don't think has educational worth. And um, for a long time, YouTube was one of those things that they didn't think was, was worth students being able to watch so that was blocked and uh if i wanted to get any educational content from there uh well i was kind of out of luck i had to use my own like cellular connection um but uh in order to find like in order to grab podcast episodes that had educational use that was much easier because um like spps like n none of the individual 
like hosting providers for um for podcasts was really large enough for SPPS to go, oh, there's a bunch of content on here that is bad. We shouldn't let yeah. this through. They're um, not just going to block loading any MP3 file, right? Exactly. That would be ridiculous. Um, the one exception here is uh, SoundCloud. SoundCloud is blocked at SPPS, which bit me in the butt one time. <laughs> yeah, that is a large, you know, music streaming. Mm-hmm. Yep. Usually yep. site. Um, it can result in less fragmentation so if um content is kind of everywhere you can kind of um i don't know um yeah so so since i don't have to so since i don't have to worry about like what system my friend uses right we can still communicate with each other no matter like which email client we both use no matter which podcast player we both use right we can both still access the same the same content um whereas like like so my household right now me and my housemates we're all going through the process right now of figuring out uh do we want to switch from like you know facebook messenger for our group chat to something else and you know it's like okay we could use sms but like sms doesn't work super well sometimes between different you know like uh, it's not internet based exactly Um, well on ios you can do these depending on your carrier you can do wi-fi based stuff yeah 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 yeah. but um you know i was suggesting like slack because i'm in love with slack and everybody else is like what the heck is slack can we use discord and i'm like but discord is blocked at school and yeah you know so it's like all of like that that's the fragmentation that i'm trying to avoid um by using a decentralized system yeah so you'd use a common protocol like sms or Mm -hmm. um, jabber or irc versus proprietary applications that are centralized yep yep um one of my favorite things about decentralized systems is that they are incompatible with drm you can't really distribute um content that is managed that that has restrictions on it if you know the like if the basis of this distribution system is decentralized um because by necessity you have to be giving them like the content itself and and after that you can't control what they do with it well, if you feed it encrypted content and then you have some decentralized authentication system, you could... What if, is a if decentralized was, authentication system? I don't know. But if, if a hypothetical situation were you had a bunch of nodes and if you know you said, I want to make myself a new user and I think I'm trusted, if you put that on your own node, sure, that works, but no one else would know about it. So maybe then you go talk over to, to Brandon across the room and be like, hey, Brandon, do you trust me? I'm a good user. And he says, okay, you're trusted. And you do that with enough people. And then all of a sudden as a whole, you know, over half or whatever say, okay, that's trusted. Let's, let's go with that. Okay. So this is like authentication via blockchain. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how feasible or realistic or anything. I'm sure someone could talk me down out of that entire thought. That sounds like a pretty annoying process myself too, but. And also what I'm thinking about is that like, um, you know, if if they wanted to serve me encrypted content that only I can open, then they would need some sort of key of mine, right, to encrypt it with, and and then the content could only be coming from one place. It could only be coming from one central server. But I guess that that would still work because they would, yeah, the the content creator would still be just like in control of the server itself. Yeah. Well, like sure. how G, uh, GPG keys, so GNU, what is it? Pup, uh, shoot. I don't remember. Let me look it up what it stands for. Of course, once but I it, decrypt it, then I can do whatever I want with it, though, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, so it's still... But like, if, if the system is only hosting the files, then, you know, once yes, once anyone downloads and encrypts it, then it's fine. But the distributed system as a whole doesn't know what it is because it's storing something encrypted. Right. And that's kind of how, like... GPG, which is GNU Privacy Guard, um, how you would encrypt an email. You would you would put your private or your public key out there, and then you would share your your private keys or something with other people, and then they say, "Okay, I've like had verbal or digital contact with you, and I know you're trusted, and you are who you say you are. So I'm going to be able to decrypt what you're sending me." Okay. So while email is distributed, it's not secure really inherently so they're encrypting it with gpg on top of email there you go yeah yeah yeah. everyone you send it to can decrypt it Mm -hmm. who you trust 
Yeah, and then after that, they can forward it to whoever they want. Um, yeah, so the 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 content is not permanently like. Well, no, DRM'd. they they wouldn't be able to forward because the email is always encrypted. Just on their client, they can read it. Then okay. they would have to copy that and paste mm-hmm. it in. So it would be, it's like any encrypted anything encrypted. You in the end are seeing an analog decrypted version. You know, like any web page yeah. is loaded through HTTPS. It's in the end, you can see it and see the content of everything that comes to you, but you're you're not necessarily saying, "Ooh, look at this page! I'm going to share it everywhere," right? Because you just <laughs> share the link to everyone who has access. But because it's you know the internet, it's designed to be accessible by everyone except for those who have a broken security right. setup. And I guess I that. guess that the difference here uh, is that like the person who's who's hosting the file who's giving me the file also does not control the client side of things right so in a in a centralized like drm system uh if i'm playing something from netflix right netflix controls the the player on my computer as well as what they're sending me from their servers because the player is literally their own um you know their own web page right and yeah. so because I like, yeah, um, but in a, in, a, in a truly decentralized system, I would be able to use whatever player I want to on my own end to play that that content. Yeah, definitely. Um, another advantage of uh, decentralized systems is discoverability, because if, uh, for example, um, you know, if I only put my my um, videos up on YouTube then anybody who doesn't use YouTube is never going to find it, right? Um, whereas with a decentralized system, then anybody, you know, can can go and, and grab it. Um, on the other hand, centralized systems are very, very good for uh, discoverability because <laughs> once they hit a critical, you know, user base, then, um, you know, they, they tend to promote whatever content is on their own system to people who are on their system, right? So when I go onto YouTube, I'm never going to see in the sidebar a video from that's hosted on Vimeo, right? Because YouTube doesn't want me to leave. Yeah, I would say discoverability is more about how popular the service or platform is in the first place. Mm-hmm. And you can have popular distributed ones, but generally popular... Uh, you know, centralized systems are more popular because they're they have they're usually part of a company that has marketing and you know wants users to be engaged yep. and active. And they can take advantage of the economies of scale um, because most of the centralized platforms that are like large enough to be part of our like kind of cultural um, like like you know if if I say. YouTube video like everybody knows what that means if I if I say like social media everybody thinks of either like Facebook or Twitter right Um, and those centralized platforms have succeeded so much because they can be offered for free right and um, because they have just this mass that uh, you know they have enough users that they can recoup all those costs through usually through advertising almost always through advertising Um, whereas with like a distributed system um, you it, you know, it, it usually costs too much to offer those systems for free to people. Um, and, uh, you know, because, like, I mean, even just, like, owning a domain, right? That's, like, that's where you got to start. And that costs money. Yeah. Now, I would argue some of these centralized systems are hosted distributedly. So content delivery networks and things, you have data centers around the world and you're doing you know, network aggregation to see, okay, uh, what's your closest, you know, data center? What's going to have the best latency? And then, you're, and then each, inside each center, you're going to have load balancers that distribute the load across many, many, many different web servers and, and different databases. Right. So you're, so you're talking about like if I visit google.com, the server that I'm getting content from is not necessarily the same server as somebody who is in Japan and is visiting google.com. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, but the key there is that Google controls all of those servers. Yeah. yeah. And to get to a point, you need to be a very successful centralized service, or you need to at least invest some money where, yep. you know, uh, another dis- distributed network could be all volunteer based. And so the cost could be almost cheap, but then, you know, the 
the trust could fall down and things too. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of my favorite things about decentralized systems is that we don't really have to worry about like a central provider uh, closing down, you know, and we lose everything or um, making changes that we like don't like. Um, so GitHub would, would be an example there. A lot of people are very nervous about uh, Microsoft acquiring them. Um, Twitter. The nice thing about that is you can move your Git repository to anywhere and you have the entire history of the entire repos- of the entire project. Right, because that's a property of Git. Which is an open source. Yep open source thing um twitter is another great example of this because uh currently a lot of power users and you and i included are very very upset with them because they are closing down uh access for for certain parts of their api uh so the third party apps that we use to uh, interact with twitter are no longer going to be able to do things like send us push notifications or uh, automatically update the timeline and stuff like that um and uh like if Twitter follows through with this, we have no way to get that functionality back. There's nothing that we can do. Well, we use their proprietary service. We use their first party application. Yeah, exactly. Um and and like that's the kind of thing that we want to avoid having happen. So now let's talk about a few pros of centralized systems. Yes. You mentioned discoverability a little bit. Um, Because centralized systems are usually more popular, they're more discoverable, I would argue. Um, I would definitely agree. That was was one of my tongue-in-cheek things where I said, they're both good for discoverability, but centralized systems are clearly better for discoverability uh, currently. Yes, you can discover things on them. as also, you mentioned kind of they are compatible with DRM because they're completely closed and, you know, kind of one entity controls them. They can lock things up however they please. Yep. And I think that that's one of the big keys to understanding why there's so much corporate backing behind centralized systems is because, yeah, they, they can have more control over how we use the content that they are giving to us. Yeah. They often have, you know, complete control. And if they want to say, you know, let's switch the whole purpose of this, they can do that because they are the the sole proprietors of that platform um mm-hmm. so and because of that they can sometimes iterate faster than distributed systems you don't have to update everything across the whole network you know potentially you know millions of nodes or something they can just well update you, you their do one usually and... have to update all of those nodes the difference is that all of those nodes are controlled by a central entity you can yeah. update all the nodes at once yeah exactly yeah. So quite often the reality is not super cut and dry on whether the systems that you're interacting with are either centralized or decentralized. Um, You usually find like kind of a mixture of the two. So for like example, uh, YouTube is definitely a centralized system. Um, They, you know, we we address that they only show other videos that are also going to be on YouTube. Um, Anytime that you are going to... um, play a video from youtube you have to do it either through their website or through one of their approved apps you can't just like um well you're not supposed to just be able to grab a an mp4 file of uh of of a youtube video um but they do interoperate with a few like decentralized aspects so for example i discovered uh quite a few years ago that i could actually subscribe to youtube channels in my rss reader Mm. and that was kind of the turning point at which i really started using youtube as a place where i actually like came back on a regular basis to see more content from the same uh content creators over and over again right um is when i was able to start using uh, RSS feeds. Yeah, totally. Twitter also is definitely centralized, but they provide APIs for doing many actions on the site. Um, so I can, you know, automatically take all of my uh, the tweets that I post on Twitter, and as soon as they're posted, have some other service do something with them. So like I can um, have if this then that, which is by the way a great website. Go check them out. Um, yeah, 
I can have those tweets then become posts in other places um, if I want to. Like we were talking about, Git is a distributed, um, is a decentralized system for code repositories, um, but then GitHub is a centralized platform that is built on top of that, um, on top of that platform. Kind of a related issue to this is that um, the GDPR, which uh, is a very large and all-encompassing law that uh, we covered uh, in last month's episode of The Extra Dimension. Go check that out at thenexus.tv slash TED32. Uh, the GDPR forces companies who, that are storing users' personal data to allow those users to export their data in an industry standard format and move it to other services. Um, and if you if you're operating in a decentralized system, then basically you're already doing that because all of the content, uh, at least the public facing content, is already being delivered in an industry standard format that can be uh, ingested and used by other other platforms. Uh, decentralized systems and open source interact with some interesting ways. Uh, they're very, very related, but not exactly the same. Hmm. Um, so for example, if a platform is open source, uh, it can't really be like centralized purely because anybody could just like take the code and compile it and run it on their own hardware and then we've got you know a different instance of that centralized platform and um you know even even if those two instances can't talk to each other uh and and interoperate then we still do have like two different like copies of this uh centralized systems and so because clients can choose between the two different um those two different instances uh it's not a truly centralized system uh however just because a system is open sourced doesn't mean that it has federation built in um and so it's not exactly decentralized in that case either. Um, so like when we were talking about the GitLab example, right, that would be a an example of an open sourced uh, platform that isn't quite like centralized centralized. I mean, it is, but it's not, it's definitely, it's not decentralized either because like other people who are running GitLab on their own servers can't just like access the content that is on gitlab.com uh, without actually like visiting gitlab.com. In uh, in Ryan's words, platforms come and go, and uh, yeah, I love I love the way that he said that because um, it makes me realize that like, hang on, there's even though like I post my my podcasts on a decentralized system, you know, we we control uh the hosting for our own stuff there's so much content that i produce it usually in the form of microblogs of tweets right that like i'm just putting up on these centralized services that i have no control over and um what am i gonna do <laughs> yeah so this has actually led me to really think about about like that kind of thing of where where I put my data where I put my content um and one of my highest ideals is that I I really really want to preserve data right I still have most of my school projects even you know all the way back to high school um that sixth grade on yeah I got ex it exactly um and and so like I really want to avoid allowing my content to only live on centralized platforms um, that are out of my control. But then, like, I can't just, like, ignore those platforms because they have a critical mass of people, right? If I want people to actually be able to see what I am doing, I can't not post it to Twitter or Facebook, right? Um, yeah. The podcasts on this network are actually a really good example of this uh, because I 
realized a couple of years ago that like YouTube is probably too big to ignore and not use. Um, but YouTube also is not like a proper podcasting solution, right? You can't just like host a podcast on YouTube and have it be accessible in an RSS feed as just like an MP3 file, the way that uh, podcast players expect to receive it. Um, so we actually post all of our podcast episodes both on our own website in the RSS feed for podcast players, but we also put them on up on YouTube uh, just, you know, to take advantage of the discoverability that you can get on that platform. And, and like, I'm also really conflicted about this because, um, like, Facebook in particular, right? I really don't like Facebook as a company. I'm so over them. Um, and the, you know, the recent um, uh, Cambridge Analytica, you know, snafu is just kind of like the tip of the iceberg there. Um, and and I like, I want to stop posting stuff on Twi- on on Facebook because I don't want to like me posting stuff on Facebook it like adds value to their platform right so it makes it harder for people to leave that platform because like you know because we're all posting stuff on there and that's the only place to go and see it um so like even even though i feel like i can't leave the platform i feel very guilty about the fact that i'm not leaving the platform (laughs) yeah um It's, it's you know it's it's at that critical mass yeah um and so I think I think the solution that I uh, am am leaning towards right now I'm sort of partially using this solution already. Um, like so, currently I have Twitter set up to like anything that I tweet also gets pushed over to Facebook, right? Um, now both of those are centralized systems, of course. So I think that if I want to take this to the extreme, what I need to do is I need to build up my website to be like a host for literally everything that I publish. Uh, and have everything like organized into RSS feeds, um, but then also like copy those things over into the appropriate centralized platforms that happen to be popular at the time, right? Um, so currently, right, I would probably have an RSS feed on my website for like a microblog, and then anything that gets posted there also gets tweeted and gets posted on Facebook. So then, like, you know, my friends and family who don't understand rss feeds aren't going to be missing out on on you know the stuff that they want to read from me but also i still have a copy of my stuff that i you know is independent of any any other entities yeah just use every social network as and distribute your activity across all of the centralized networks just post everywhere all the time yeah Seriously. but but i think that the key here is i also need to have my own website and have everything on there as well in order to ensure that like i don't i don't lose it yeah when i like leave you know because like there are a whole bunch of google plus posts uh from before i got a twitter account that i'm sure i would love to still have but like i don't have a good way to like export those i think they're lost no one used google plus yeah. <laughs> which makes me really sad because like i really liked the platform from from a uh technical perspective there's just nobody yeah. on there All right, so Brian, before we yeah. leave, where can where can what decentralized systems can people find you on on the internet? You can find me on https colon slash slash brianm dot me, hosted on GitHub pages. But <laughs> the internet is decentralized, so hey, yep, yep, you can yep. Find me there or on my uh, centralized Twitter at Brian Mitch L. You could also find me in our de- decentralized world, hanging out in Uptown, living in my apartment. There you go. In person. That's decentralized, right? And uh, I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me, well, on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. <laughs> uh, and I have a, a website, ianrbuck.com, that uh, currently does not serve much purpose, but I uh, have big dreams for it. <laughs> that and it I... does have a valid certificate. Yes, currently. I... <laughs> Signed by a centralized authority. <laughs> Um, and we uh, are The Nexus. This has been a production of The Nexus. You, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can uh, 
send us an email. That's a nice and decentralized platform, uh, thenexustv at gmail.com. Uh, or if you want to discuss this episode with other listeners, you can go to uh, our subreddit at r slash thenexustv. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have, Have a, a good, good one. one.